At stage four, as we have seen, laws, rules, traditions, and social conventions are regarded as absolute and unchangeable, and the status quo, the system, is acknowledged to be flawed, but is assumed to be as good as it gets. Everyone should stop talking and do what is expected. For example, at the conclusion of the Trayvon Martin trial in 2013, many people said, the jury has decided and the court has spoken. Case closed. But others had their faith in the legal establishment shaken a bit. They began to wonder if the system itself, in this case the legal system, isn't flawed. Did the fact that the victim was an African-American teenage boy play a role in the jury's decision? Do the courts in general treat people of color the same as fair-skinned people? Aren't there unquestionable statistics proving the answer to that question is no? Doesn't the legal system itself need reform? Such questioning of the status quo of the system can be the beginning of post-conventional moral reasoning. Level 3, post-conventional moral reasoning, the fully formed, the mature conscience. At stage five, which Kohlberg calls the social contract orientation, there is a further development over stage four reasoning. The person has now come to understand that the system with its laws and rules are not set in stone, but are social contracts. That is, they are agreements entered into by members of a society. It is okay to question, challenge, and change laws, and the system itself if need be. After all, human beings made these rules and created the status quo. So if necessary, human beings can bring about change, as long as that change is made democratically and in the name of the common good. The most famous and most obvious American social contract is the U.S. Constitution itself. It is a social agreement that, through our elected representatives, we all agree to observe. Clearly, the Constitution's framers did not reason at stage four. If they had, they would have assumed that the Constitution was carved in stone, that it was unchangeable and simply to be obeyed. But in fact, America's founding mothers and fathers built into the Constitution a provision for change, an amendment process, a clear sign of what Kohlberg means by stage five moral reasoning. And if the Constitution can be amended, all elements of the social contract, all the rules and laws we have in some way agreed to abide by, all are subject to question and, if necessary, change as well. What is good, right, and worthwhile? At stage five, the person believes that the good is whatever has been democratically agreed upon and so is now part of the social contract, assuming, of course, that what is agreed upon is truly in the common good. A simple example. By means of our elected representatives, we have all agreed to drive our cars on the right side of the road. This element of our social contract creates order, and thus it is clearly in the common good. If we were free to drive on whatever side of the road we choose, no one would get anywhere. But we could change that law if we chose to. Obviously, at stage five, it is assumed that what is bad and wrong is whatever violates the democratically agreed upon rules and laws, and whatever contradicts the common good. Demonstrate that a rule or law contradicts the common good, and the stage five conscience will agree that it's time for change. And the stage five conscience assumes that whatever is not specifically included in the social contract is a matter of personal taste or choice. What society doesn't decide is left to the individual. For example, the First Amendment to the Constitution says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. In other words, the choice to be religious or not is excluded from the social contract. So it is a matter of choice for the individual. At stage four, the person tended to focus on the letter of the law. But now at stage five, the spirit of laws and rules becomes primary. People are less concerned about the details about the exact proscriptions of laws and rules, and are beginning to ask about the values or principles that underlie them. They want to know why. An example, why should I be truthful and honest? Well, we should deal with one another honestly. We should avoid lying and cheating, because truthfulness is in the common good. After all, to a great extent, life in society is based on trust. 
The stage 5 individual is beginning to think for herself and is moving away from heteronymous and towards autonomous reasoning. After much reflection over time, then, some individuals come to realize that most good laws, rules, customs, and conventions are based on and can be boiled down to and are designed to protect a few key values and principles, principles such as justice, the equality and reciprocity of human rights, the dignity of each individual, the sacredness of life, and so forth. Gradually, they may come to own these values and principles, in and for themselves. At stage six, the abstract moral principle orientation, the person has indeed ingested these values and made them his or her own. The stage six person has gone beyond individual laws, customs, and rules, and now embraces the values and principles that underlie them. They have figured out for themselves why honesty is good and dishonesty is not. Now, as an incentive to be honest, the person with a stage six conscience no longer needs someone to threaten them with punishment, stage one, or to promise them a reward, stage two. They no longer need peer pressure, stage three. And in a way, they don't even need laws to help them figure out what is right and good, stage four. And they don't even need a social contract, stage five. Now they believe in the virtue of honesty. It's part of them, part of their soul, their deepest self, their conscience. Now if they were to act dishonestly, they would feel as if they let themselves down, as if they had betrayed themselves and violated themselves. In the play and movie A Man for All Seasons, Thomas More, a Catholic, refuses to renounce his allegiance to the Pope and to take a vow acknowledging the King of England as head of the Church. In this brief clip, Moore, played by actor Paul Schofield, is trying to explain to his friend why he refuses to take the vow. I will not give in because I oppose it. Not my pride, not my spleen, nor any other of my appetites, but I do. I... Moore refuses to go against his conscience, his real self, his real I. The stage six person is governed by his or her own conscience, by internal forces, by their own character. What is right is whatever is in accordance with those values and principles that one has accepted and ingested and now believes in a personal way that are now part of one's character and one's conscience. As Thomas More's words indicate, acting in accord with those abstract moral values and principles is at the same time being faithful to oneself. Bad or wrong is whatever violates these personally held values and principles. Violating them means being unfaithful to one's own authentic self. As mentioned above, Kohlberg found that these stage six values and virtues are positive human values, such as justice, equality, the reciprocity of human rights, the dignity of the human person, the sacredness of life, and so forth. Kohlberg himself was an atheist, so it is interesting to note that when asked to provide examples of stage six reasoning, most of the people he lists are religious figures, such as the Buddha, Jesus of Nazareth, Francis of Assisi, St. Thomas More, and Martin Luther King, Jr., According to Kohlberg's research, the person who reasons at stage six has a mature, fully formed conscience. In fact, most of the time when the word conscience is used, what is usually meant is this type of principled conscience. This person is now autonomous, autonomous from auto, self, and nomos, rule. That is, the person is no longer governed by the principles and values of others, but by her or his own personally validated conscience. The person with a fully formed conscience is truly, authentically free. The heteronymous person may imagine herself or himself to be free, but isn't. The donkey who says, I happen to want to chase the carrot and avoid the stick, so I'm in charge and I'm free, is only kidding itself. The driver who controls the carrot and stick is obviously in control. Autonomy means freedom, an escape from groupthink from the herd. 
Jiminy Cricket says, always let your conscience be your guide. And St. Augustine once said, love and do anything you want. That's interesting. That's great advice to give to someone with a fully formed conscience. But would we really want to give that advice to a person with an immature conscience? A person who reasons heteronymously?